Uh, hello, world. I think we are streaming. Um, hi, my name is Virginia. I am part of the Special Collections Research Center here at NC State University Libraries. Um, I'm excited to be here. This is my first time doing anything on Twitch. Um, and our department, Special Collections, is um, part of the libraries that collects and preserves and provides access to rare and unique original materials. A lot of really cool, one-of-a-kind, um, unusual, uh, fascinating stuff. Um, so we, we collect these things, we take really good care of them to make sure they last a very long time so that researchers can access them for years and years to come. Um, and a lot of times archives are kind of a mystery. A lot of our things are kept behind locked doors and in, in kind of uh, very, uh, you know, fortified boxes and acid-free folders so that they um, stay healthy and preserved for many years. But that can also present a barrier. People don't always know what's in our collections or what, what are in archives and how to use them. Um, so my job, I work with outreach in the libraries for special collections and our whole department. We are really focused on making sure people know about what we have and can make use of them. So. Um, what we want to do today, I'm going to kind of take you on a little tour of some of my favorite things from our collections, um, do a little unboxing, um, and we're going to do this as, as a series in the future. We're going to have folks who uh, either work with our collections as uh, librarians or student workers um, or as researchers, faculty, people who um, have their own perspective and specialties that um, bring some uh, insight to what we have. So um, I will uh, preface this by saying I'm not an expert in any of the materials that I'm going to show today. I just really like them and I have a personal interest in them. Um, I also use these materials in classes. We do a lot of teaching with our collections um, and it's, uh, it's very cool to teach with this stuff at a school like NC State, which has, uh, it's a land-grant university. Um, it's uh, teaching and research strengths are in a lot of STEM fields, and those are the fields that we collect in. Our collecting areas are um, in things like agriculture and textiles and engineering, um, architecture and design, um, all kinds of stuff. And you can learn about those collecting areas on our website, which is in the chat. Um, and shout out, thank you to Claire for our, being our moderator today. Um, very excited to, to be able to do this and uh, appreciate all the help from the folks who've made this possible. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I brought a couple of boxes here. First up from the uh, Cooperative Extension Service Home Demonstration Record. Um, so those are a lot of words you prob that probably don't mean anything to most people. Um, they didn't really mean anything to me until I started working here and learning about Cooperative Extension, um, which is a big part of the land-grant legacy and mission. Um, NC State, as a land-grant, is uh, committed to um, extending the knowledge that is generated on a campus like this um, back into the communities that are around the state of North Carolina. So um, research happening on campus and at research stations throughout the state is then, um, it's sort of the responsibility of the university and the extension service to bring that information back out into um, communities, rural communities um, especially, from the beginning of the university. That's been a big part of our mission. Um, so extension is really kind of like a community um, embedded uh, educational program that's been part of the university's history from the beginning and any other land grants around the, the United States. So um, part of cooperative extension is, uh, from the beginning there was uh, sort of a service, um, well let me back up. So lots of fractions within cooperative extension and land grant um, kind of structure um, given the history of our, our country and the region of the American South. Um, racially segregated from the beginning, so NC State University was the uh, white university land grant. 
um, North Carolina A&T State University in, in Greensboro, North Carolina, is the historically black land grant. So those two institutions were formed separately. Um, likewise, Extension and Home Demonstration were formed separately, as well as 4-H and some other things that we're going to talk about. So I'm going to kind of dive into little parts of those different histories as we go. Um, but to kind of <laughs> zoom back a bit, um, this collection I have just brought out um, shows you kind of how these things look in the archives. Um, it's, it's cool to see this folder on a uh, kind of overhead camera here. Um, so we keep all of these documents that come to us, perhaps in different states of chaos and disarray, um, or states of hyper-organization, depending on who collected them and created them. Um, they come to us in all different manners of organization. We, uh, our staff will go through things and arrange them in a way that um, kind of is, is in line with how the creator had them, but will also be accessible for researchers. So um, we put things in folders according to how they were organized by the creator. Um, we name the folders, we put them in boxes, um, and then those folders and boxes go into what we call a finding aid. Uh, we a list, basically, of what's in the collection, kind of an inventory. Um, and the link in the uh, chat there tells you, uh, the, it shows the link to the collection guide for this material. Um, so if you go to that link, you can see um, the home demonstration family and consumer sciences um, records. Um, home demonstration was the original name of what is now family and consumer sciences. It's still a part of extension today. So um, this is an example of one of the boxes uh, that you'd see, you'd, you'd take out, if, if you were a researcher coming to our reading room, um, if you re requested to see this box after reading the finding aid, um, this is what you would see. You would get a box like this, um, here's a top-down view. You get a little outslip like this, a little card that goes in when you take a folder out. Um, and then you get your folder on the table and you dig into some really cool original material. Um, so the finding aids, there's a question from the moderator. Those are created often by students who work with us. Um, we have undergrads who uh, and graduate students who help um, rehouse the stuff, which is our word for you know putting things into asset-free folders and boxes that are safe for things. Um, and then our uh, students and our staff in technical services um, put everything together into this document called a finding aid. And there's a whole kind of like coding background uh, back end to it. It's structured data, metadata that um, archivists use across institutions. So a finding aid at NC State will have the same components of a finding aid at UNC Chapel Hill or um, UC Davis or anywhere else in, in um, the archives world. So it makes it a little easier for researchers to find what they're looking for across different institutions. Um, and they're really cool documents. The first time you might look at one, it might seem like, you know, very dry. Um, I printed out some so I can refer to them um, as we're going here so I can just show you um, uh, the kind of uh, uh, butchered formatting version of this that the printer put together, but um, a, co a collection guide will show you who created it, how much stuff is there, so in this case it's about 26 boxes. They'll have a call number where you can refer to kind of the unique ID for the collection. And then there's a whole bunch of information usually about who created this stuff and donated it potentially. Um, in this case, a whole kind of historical note about cooperative extension. Um, which can give you a ton of great information, background information, when you're, you're starting research. Um, and then we'll tell you what the stuff is, the scope and content note. That's, um, that'll tell you, you know, what dates does this material cover? What kind of formats are included? Is it documents, photographs, um, architectural drawings, audiovisual materials? Um, artifacts, anything like that will be included in here, and, and what topics does it cover? Um, so that gives you a quick idea of what's, what's the stuff, what's in here. Um, so we are going to take a little look at this folder. This is really one of my favorite folders in all of our collections. Um, my personal interest in a lot of these materials is food, food history, um, and 
nutrition and health ideas about how food and nutrition and health um, evolved historically and how at NC State, how cooperative extension and home demonstration and 4-H and all kinds of kind of community outreach programs were involved in these changing ideas around food and nutrition. Um, so this folder here is um, it's from the collection that is uh, linked in the chat there. Um, you can see a little bit of the titles here. Um, the, the folder uh, is from box five, folder six um, of the collection. This is a binder, basically a, a, a bunch of materials that would have been part of a uh, home demonstration agent's packet of information. Um, so an agent uh, would have been trained to, like it would have been a woman trained to go to rural communities in, in a specific county, usually she'd be assigned to a specific county, to teach other women and children about nutrition and food and health in this case, or about um, other sort of home uh, economics and sciences topics. Um, the, the whole idea of extension, like I mentioned, is to bring the latest uh, research and tools into rural communities and, and communities rural or urban around North Carolina. So um, the, the home demonstration uh, wing of extension was, was begun around 1914, I believe, um, by Jane McKimmon. She was the first um, home demonstration agent at NC State, so that was the beginning of um, the white uh, extension service geared toward women. Um, a few years later, Dazelle Foster Lowe was the first uh, black extension home demonstration agent, um, founder of home demonstration for African American communities in North Carolina. So Jane McKimmon, um, began this program basically to educate women and children in North Carolina. Um, she was evolving this program from uh, the example of Ira Schaub, who I'll talk a little bit more about later, but Ira Schaub um, kind of de developed or founded extension for, NC for North Carolina, agricultural extension for the state. Um, and Schaub and McKimmon both really thought that um, reaching children was a great way to teach uh, families, farming families especially, about these new practices and new sort of scientific approaches to agriculture, farming, um, gardening, home, homekeeping um, that they were wanting to, to share with North Carolinians. Um, so Jane McKimmon uh, founded some clubs for girls called tomato clubs that were um, a fascinating kind of story in North Carolina history. The state archives of North Carolina and Raleigh have a ton of um, booklets from the tomato club girls. Um, there was another Twitch stream uh, about this whole history of the tomato clubs um, that you could catch on the library's um, Twitch uh, lineup. Um, that happened back in early June, I believe, so um, you can check that out for more information. But State Archives has the booklets, and then uh, we've digitized them. NC State uh, partnered with the State Archives to digitize those booklets and put them online. So you can find those in our digitized collections. Um, we can put the link to those, those uh, rare and unique digital collections um, in the chat. So um, if you're interested, click that link, type in Tomato Clubs, and you'll see these fascinating booklets. Um, basically young girls who were being taught how to grow tomatoes, plan uh, and plant a garden of tomatoes, and then uh, can and sell their tomatoes. Um, really kind of groundbreaking, um, progressive um, founding principle of teaching young rural girls how to use this emerging technology of canning to um, make an income for themselves and their families. So that was one example of the early um, uh, kind of impacts of home demonstration. Um, but it also, uh, in addition to teaching children um, in, in clubs like the Tomato Clubs, um, and also young boys were part of clubs like Corn Clubs, Pig Clubs, um, Poultry Clubs, where they were learning how to grow and uh, tend 
gardens and livestock um, to be, you know, the latest, the, the newest technologies to be a farmer in the future. Um, this, these kinds of things evolved into 4-H eventually. So um, the, the children were learning these things to kind of help persuade their parents to evolve their practices as well. Um, and uh, so some of the things that we'll see in this folder are what agents working in these communities would have used to uh, teach about food and nutrition. So um, I want to just get into some of this stuff. Um, we've been talking a lot about the history. Let's look at what's actually here. Um, so this folder, most of these materials are from probably the 1930s. This one is dated um, 1935, um, getting the most for your food money. Um, so here we're seeing um, if men and women are, are to feel well and able to work, if children are to be healthy and able to go to school, they must have food enough and they must have the right kinds of food. Um, here's a guide to food enough and the right kinds of food, the foods you need for your whole family. So the audience here is women um, who are sort of responsible for raising healthy um, families and workers um, for North Carolina's agriculture and economy and infrastructure. Um, it was a big responsibility that women had and, and food was a part of that to, to feed and, and fuel um, and raise healthy, healthy families. Um, so here's the advice for the whole family in the 1930s. All the things that you should feed someone every day, um, grains, bread, potatoes, milk, fresh evaporated or dried, um, one or more vegetables or fruits, especially green and yellow ones, molasses, sugar, other sweets, butter, lard, fat, meat, other fats, plenty of water to drink, um, and then to, several times a week, tomatoes, raw cabbage, raw fruit, interesting. Not recommending that every single day, but several times a week. Um, dried beans, peas, or peanuts. Probably uh, m we would imagine we eat those more often than a few times a week now. Um, I'm, I'm not a nutritionist, but I, I do work a lot with nutrition classes, and it's always interesting to see how advice like this has changed um, since it first was um, published in, in something like this. Um, and then give young children milk at every meal, every meal. This is something that I see a lot of nutrition students reacting to. Um, so many materials in the collections like this are really pushing milk for, for children especially, and so much milk. Nutrition students today are amazed at the amount of milk was recommended for kids. Um, it's very different, apparently, from what we're uh, learning today and what rec nutritionists um, recommend today. Um, if you grew up in the 80s and 90s like me, milk was still pushed pretty heavily, but, uh, and, and this probably began pretty early um, in, in the case of this pamphlet from the 30s. We have a lot of photographs of um, drink milk campaigns from the um, 40s, 50s, and 60s, too. Um, but that's something that's changed. So what vegetables wouldn't be green or yellow? It's a spe specific requirement. It's very true. Um, carrots, bell peppers, um, you know, we know tomatoes are fruits, but uh, those are important and they're not green or yellow. Um, yeah, I don't know why that would be. There, there are different ideas about what <laughs> the nutritional value of foods were based on the physical characteristics of them and what it was understood that they did in, in the body. So it's really interesting to see things like that. Um, so here's a little breakdown of what all these foods are meant to do. Um, let's see if it says anything about the color of the food. So again here milk is sort of the, the, the golden nutritional item. Milk does more for the body than any other food and does it more cheaply safeguards the low-cost diet for children and adults. It prevents pellagra. Pellagra was a sort of malnutrition um, disease that affected a lot of rural low-income communities um, for a lot of the 20th century and earlier in the American South especially. And you see pellagra mentioned a lot in extension food and nutrition materials. Um, so here milk is 
uh, a kind of cure for pellagra, and it is, quote, the best all-around bodybuilding food. Um, so let's see. Um, vegetables and fruits are needed by everybody. When you have provided tomatoes or raw cabbage, add greens and as many other vegetables and fruits as you can get. Um, yeah, and tomatoes, oranges, and raw cabbage have special values. Give babies and little children some tomato juice or orange juice every day. Use for all the family often. Um, yeah, I think that's probably <laughs> tomato juice or orange juice for babies every day. Not really recommended now, but <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see, you know, the, the needs of these communities are different from what we know for ourselves now, too. Um, foods rich in fat supply abundant fuel and give flavor to the meal. Thinking about the needs of people who were um, in family farms, you know, around the state, they needed a lot of calories. They needed a lot of fat. Um, you know, potatoes, those, you know, carbohydrates to, to keep them, um, you know, give them quick energy. That was a huge part of it. And a lot of our lifestyles are not um, physically laboring on the farm now, so some of that advice has changed. Um, so there's a lot you can see here too about your food dollar, stretching your food dollar and making sure you're getting the most value out of the, um, the food you're, you're purchasing for your family. So you'll see things like this that are um, breaking down, you know, how many cents you should spend on each category of food. Um, a lot of very kind of scientific breakdowns of, of how to calculate the needs of a family of four. Um, this is how much food they need each week at least. So milk, 17 and a half quarts for a family of four. It's a lot of milk. Um, yeah. And 15, uh, let's see, what's the... 15 pounds of bread or other grain products. Really interesting. Um, so moving on, there's a whole bunch of stuff in this folder. Then, and I just imagine a, a home demonstration agent with her kind of binder full of this stuff going around and teaching um, women and, and children around the state. Um, salads, a little brochure about salads from the 1930s, 1938. Um, You'll see a lot of great illustrations and graphics in these publications that Extension um, would publish. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see it slightly better. Um, salads. Um, let me just take a little peek through here. Uh, this name, Mary Thomas, she shows up a lot in these materials. She was the Extension nutritionist. Um, I want to know more about her. I would love if some you know student chose a research uh, topic to learn about Mary Thomas and all the work she did because um, she was super involved in all of the nutrition education in the early 20th century. Um, so, yeah, we can see um, writing about salads come to take an important place in the daily meals. They're appetizing, economical, and easy to prepare. They give variety to the diet and they can be used for almost every occasion. A fresh green vegetable combined with vinegar, salt, and other condiments was the original salad. I wouldn't disagree with that. Um, now we think of a salad as a combination of any suitable foods, either raw or cooked, and served with a salad dressing. Um, salads are interesting because of the variety of foods from which to choose and of the unlimited combinations which give the homemaker the opportunity to originate new ideas. Um, and so thinking about who is really the, who were they trying to reach with this? Would this be, um, trying to impart the value of salads to communities that they thought needed more vegetables or who didn't understand from their perspective um, the value of this uh, part of a diet for a family. Um, so it's really breaking down all of these points, the food value, the place in the menu, um, the ways to uh, a salad together. So the essentials of a good salad should be wholesome, economical, and attractive. Yes, very important. It should be cold, crisp, and free from surplus moisture. It should be attractively arranged, not too fixed. It should harmonize in flavor and color with the rest of the meal. It should be perfectly seasoned, the ingredients well blended, and served with a well-made and appropriate dressing. 
Um, so it's a lot of information about salads and um, garnishes. You know, I, I just love, I love this stuff. Um, there are a lot of rules, a lot of rules about salads here. So um, some things we, I would not disagree with, you know, to ensure a crisp salad, don't add the dressing until just before serving. Um, Ooh, interesting. Season salads with care. An intriguing seasoning for a salad may be obtained by rubbing the salad bowl with onion or a bit of garlic. I've never heard that. Not a bad idea, but maybe, uh, maybe not a good idea. I mean, I don't know. That could be good. Rub an onion on the salad bowl before you toss the salad. Um, never repeat a vegetable or fruit in a salad that is used in any other way in a meal. That's a rule I have not heard. I, you know, I think you could break that rule pretty easily and it would be fine. Um, yeah, so all kinds of stuff. Salad dressings. We talk a lot in our, um, our department about some questionable salads that we see recipes for, and especially in the 50s and 60s, a lot using Jello that I would not really find appetizing. I totally respect folks who do, but there are um, some really interesting recipes for salads that you can find in some of these older older books. Um, this is one of the earlier ones, the 1930s. We don't see a ton, but um, we see some dressings here, mayonnaise dressings, a lot of, you know, still, I love a good ranch dressing. Um, mayonnaise is, is a great rec uh, great ingredient for a lot of good, good things, um, but Cream salad dressing, um, thick cream, lemon juice, vinegar, mustard, sugar, salt, paprika. That all sounds like it would be delicious. Golden dressing, pineapple juice, lemon, flour, sugar, yolk, salt. Um, wouldn't have wouldn't have thought about combining those things, but um, this was suggested to serve with a fruit salad. Um, and you would cook the dressing. Um, that makes sense with the egg yolks. You'd add. Um, all the ingredients together, cook in a double boiler until thick, and then when cold, fold in whipped cream. Yeah, that's definitely getting into the kind of 50s fruit salad style stuff. So lots of different combinations, and here's a recipe for Mrs. McKinnon's favorite supper salad. So that's Jane McKinnon, the founder of Home Demonstration. Her favorite supper salad, potatoes, butter beans, lima beans, a staple for a lot of Southern food, string beans, tomatoes, onion juice, salt, pepper, and salad dressing. I think that sounds great. Um, and then we've got egg salads, we've got eat salads, all kinds of good stuff in here. Um, Waldorf salad, salmon salad. These are things that, you know, I would definitely eat. And then congealed salads. This is where it gets into the territory, I, you know, personally I'm not that into, but tomato aspic, a classic thing. I know a lot of Southern families have had Southern aspic on the table. Um, kind of generationally, it's it's phased out more and more, but um, you would serve it on lettuce with mayonnaise. That's how, um, that's how I've seen it done. Perfection salad. You'll see a lot of perfection salads in, in recipe books from the early 20th century. Um, I think there's a book that has perfection salad in the title too, that seems really interesting. So it has gelatin, um, vinegar, lemon, sugar, salt, cabbage, celery, and pimentos. So if that sounds good to you, try it and let me know what you think. Again, served on a lettuce leaf with mayonnaise on top. So um, yeah, that is all part of the same salad. The ingredients, gelatin, water, vinegar, lemon, sugar, salt, cabbage, celery, and pimentos. Cabbage, celery, pimentos, and gelatin basically. Um, so the perfection salad, I think there are different versions. I'm, I'm imagining this is not the only version. Um, there probably were different kind of regional versions and they might have changed over time. Um, I would definitely not take my word for that. I would uh, do a little bit of research, but perfection salad is definitely a thing. Um, the names of the salads are just really, really great. Golden Glow salad too. That was more of a like sweet gelatin, lemon gelatin, fruit juice, peaches, carrots, pecans. So there you have it, salads in the 30s. Um, this is a fun one too, the school lunch, Mary Thomas again, 
um, our sort of extension food and nutrition um, leader. So um, the school lunch it says the planning and packing the school lunch is just as important a problem for the mother as the planning and preparation of the meals that are served at home because she's responsible for feeding that child whether they're at her home or at school. If the child is to grow, to be active mentally and strong enough in body to combat colds and other disease, he must have a noonday meal which will combine with his meals at home to give him a well-balanced ration each day. So, every day that child should have daily a quart of milk, there it is again, two servings of vegetables in addition to potatoes, two servings of fruit, at least one serving of egg, meat, and fish, etc. So, again, giving um, the mother a lot of rules and guidelines and uh, telling her to give her child all this milk <laughs> that is not really what we what we see today um, so lots of great suggestions about sandwiches and things that you could pack your uh, for your kids lunch um, bacon and lettuce sandwich with a firm tomato gingerbread raisins and milk cottage cheese and nut sandwiches, chopped cold meat sandwiches. Um, so this is, uh, you know, food that your kid can take to school, traveling with them, 1934. Um, this one is a couple years later, 1938, um, similar uh, information um, displayed in a different way. Again, Mary Thomas is, is telling us what's good and milk number one a quart um, whether drunk as milk or incorporated into other dishes and we see some more illustrations look at these this is so great <laughs> um, desirable lunch containers so the lunch box should be easy to carry large enough for the food needed and of a material easy to clean contain air holes to ventilate otherwise the food will have a stale odor yeah, that's true. I'm sure any kid who's brought a packed lunch has, has experienced that. Um, paper boxes and bags are not desirable for the school lunch as some of the necessary foods cannot be packed well in them and remain attractive when taken out at lunchtime. Their attractiveness is always very important. Yeah, and they're walking to school. The little sandwich and the apple are really excited about the desirable lunch containers. And then we have the undesirable lunch containers. Not so, not so good. They're not not up with that um, it's great I love I love these illustrations so and then we have suggestions for the lunch shelf how to stock your pantry for for lunches um, packing aids paper spoons drinking straws rubber bands um, it's pretty neat uh, and then we go along and see well-balanced lunch following the suggested pattern meat and egg sandwiches lettuce milk cake apple that looks great. I would, I would enjoy that lunch. Um, and then we get some suggestions for sandwich fillings, more of that. Um, yeah, and some recipes. Peanut butter bread. Interesting. So I had not noticed this before. This is a, a recipe. It's not a peanut butter sandwich, but it's basically stir together some flour, sugar, baking powder, and salt, and then work in some peanut butter with a fork, add milk to make a soft dough, pour into a greased loaf pan, and bake for almost an hour. Very interesting. I, I don't, I'm not a peanut butter eater, but um, I'd be very curious, maybe with something else like almond butter, to see how that turned out. Um, yeah, all their kinds of bread, prune bread, Sandwich biscuit, Boston brown bread, oatmeal cookies, cooked salad dressing. So yeah, those those kids would have eaten some good stuff for lunch um, if if their moms were um, able to incorporate all of these very very specific and strict rules. And that's a great point, uh, moderator. All you would need for a PB and J if you had that peanut butter bread was was to bring some jelly in. Um, okay, so this is another kind of interesting thing um, from the nutrition materials. This would be something that would have gone to 4-H uh, um, kids. So 
this would again probably be from around the 1930s um, and we see grow a fine club member you and your calf both need and then down below balance ration um, so you know little boy and your you and your little calf that you're raising in 4-H you need milk green feed <laughs> roughage whole grain concentrates and abundance of clear water so um, yeah, you know, learning how to take care of a cow that you're raising for 4-H um, is also teaching you how to take care of yourself and value nutrition. Good living habits, sunshine, exercise, good ventilation, rest, and cleanliness. I love that. Um, <laughs> a well-built body, constitution, vigor, symmetry, um, rapid unchecked growth, strong straight back, straight limbs, clean joints, good heart girth, well-sprung ribs, unobstructed breathing, a well-running body, good appetite, thorough chewing, good digestion, regular bowel action, quality, clear eyes, glossy hair, smooth pliable skin, and fine carriage and action, head up, feet well placed, back straight, abdomen in. So yeah, all the things that they're learning to kind of um, raise their calf, um, they need themselves as well. And this is a, a kind of holistic, <laughs> um, view of health, food, living habits, body, um, posture, all of that. Um, this is a s the same kind of thing, but just uh, more images. Um, grow a fine club member, train your muscles to carry your body well, signs of weakness, signs of strength. And then here is our young person, signs of weakness and signs of strength. So it's something I'm really fascinated by, seeing all of these um, kind of ideal bodies for um, defining health. Um, you know, it's a sort of thing we understand is problematic now. There is no ideal body as, as an image of health. Um, all bodies can be healthy bodies. Um, but we see here that young white children in North Carolina are being um, given illustrations of what a healthy body should look like and how it should mirror your, your healthy calf. Um, so all interesting stuff. And I agree, moderator, that it's very true that sunshine should be on the list for defining health. Um, we won't go into this one. Killing and curing meat on the farm. These are, you know, other things that you'd find in some of our extension things, not, not as closely related to what I'm going to talk about today with the health and food and nutrition. So this is uh, the real kind of meat of what I think is super interesting. This is the binder, unbound, but all of the material that our extension agent would have um, carried with her into different communities. This is a binder, um, the note here says, removed from a binder entitled Foods and Nutrition. So when this collection came in, all of this material would have been in some kind of binder um, and to make sure that these these documents are um, not damaged over time, we took them out of the binder and put them into this folder, but kept a little note here saying all these things were part of a binder because that's helpful information to know that that's how they were packaged and, and um, how what the intention of, of their um, kind of physical um, grouping was. So, there's a lot in this binder. Um, and so Mary Thomas was the author of this material. Um, we can assume the extension nutritionist. And th this is gonna give the, the aims, the, the kind of uh, mission of the extension agent, the home demonstration food and nutrition um, agent. Their job, give a clear appreciation of the relation of food to health. So this is in the 30s, there's not um, nutrition is still a pretty young field of research. Um, and the idea that food can contribute to health is, is a developing science. And so it's really interesting to see during this time period how, how that was evolving. Um, their goal was to arouse an interest in having each member of the family within a normal weight zone and free from ailments indicating a faulty diet. So starting to see this focus on weight as connected to health, which we are, you know, hopefully in most good cases um, today, we are separating those two from 
each other's weight and how if they're not that is connected. Um, and to interest each family member in establishing good food habits, scoring 85 to 100 percent. So this is something you'll see too in some of these collections. There's a very strict um, kind of score to keep about health. Um, really different from what some of what we see today. Um, very rigid rules and uh, rubric for what defines health. Um, and a lot of that, if you dig deeply, you don't even need to dig that deeply, ties to um, ideas about race and gender and class that are really problematic. So it's a whole, whole kind of rich minefield of um, stuff to learn about bodies and food and nutrition and how they're understood historically. But I digress, that's a whole other topic we could go into another day. Um, so then another goal was to ensure production of adequate food supply on the farm, a year-round garden, um, a food conservation budget, at least two family cows, a standard poultry flock, and meat animals as needed. So hopefully every family would have that. That's a, that's a lot of work to, to have that. Um, but they were trying to teach the whole family how to do this together, to participate. Um, to interest women in planning meals to meet the needs of the body, to economize time and effort, to tempt the appetite, and to please the eye, and to teach methods of preparing foods to preserve their nutritive value and to give variety, um, to teach convenient, orderly, and attractive table service and table courtesies. So there you go. Um, so lots of detail up here about what the programs were that the um, home demonstration agent would be in charge of teaching. Foods for health, meals for the family, meal planning, food preparation, getting the most for your food dollar, farm food supply. Um, and then goals for the community. This is interesting. We see a long time community program um, which all organizations are effectively cooperating. So this was a pretty ambitious and community-wide um, goal for, for extension to make healthier communities in a sustainable way. Um, to get preschool children up to weight and free from preventable defects. Um, you know, pellagra being one of those big issues, a lot of children affected by um, pellagra and malnutrition, especially in rural farming communities. Um, school children up to weight with good posture, free from preventable defects. Um, periodic physical examinations in schools, um, school lunch established on permanent basis as part of the regular school routine, um, meeting established standards and having a full understanding and support of the community. So I don't know enough really about what school lunch meant at this point. And we saw those brochures talking about school lunches being the responsibility of the mother to prepare at home and send to school with your child. Um, and I'm not sure at what point schools were starting to um, provide lunches themselves. So that's an interesting question. If anyone um, is more familiar with the history of school lunch, um, I would love to learn more about that and see what you find in some of these collections. Um, they also are aiming to have nutrition classes for children where need exists, um, training and standards of nutrition for children and adults, adequate dental service within easy reach, that's really cool and still kind of an important um, challenge in a lot of communities. Mother and child clinics and balanced meals for community gatherings. So lots of community goals. Um, more and more stuff, lists of things. This I think is sort of like a, a guide to this binder. Um, what would have been in this binder? There are lesson sheets for different projects here and major projects and minor projects and special meetings. So the agent could have a, a cake project here. There are different, um, you know, this is plain cake with scorecards. So there would be in this binder somewhere, um, some project that would be like a gathering to teach how to make cakes with all of these new ideas and methods and tools. And then they would make the cakes and then they would have them judged by the rubric on the scorecard. Um, and then other kind of interesting, fun things, you know, judging a loaf of bread, um, inexpensive cakes for Christmas and cookies. So you can find all that stuff in this folder. Um, 
we don't have time to go through the whole thing today, obviously, um, but I'm just gonna kind of page through and show you some of the neat stuff here. Um, under the nutrition and health projects, there's two pieces here about pellagra and preventative foods for pellagra. Um, yeah, all kinds of stuff that these agents could, could teach. Um, so, and then, this is a really interesting document we've used in some classes before, Goals to Work For and Foods and Nutrition. So this is something um, that would have been given to um, women as a sort of like a personal checklist, thing that you are, you are responsible for all of this. Um, and it's a lot. So all these aspects of meal planning um, that they need to make sure each member of their family practices good food habits and eats the foods they should have every day. Physical condition of their family members. Um, that is your job, mom, to make sure they're all in good condition. Table service and hospitality. Um, this, is, this is what's really fascinating to me is that the table should be convenient, orderly, attractive, and appropriate to the occasion. Um, is the meal hour a constructive influence in family life? That's really interesting. Um, do my children enjoy my company? Do they understand how to welcome guests and make them feel at home? Do my children enjoy taking a reasonable share in setting, clearing away, and waiting on the table? Getting the kids involved with the work of um, presenting food to, to your family or the community. Um, do my children feel free to invite their own friends to our table? And is the meal hour a happy hour? That's, that's really, really interesting. Um, and then the school lunch, all of those rules about the school lunch and the family food supply, um, including making a plan for the garden, um, to pr provide all the food they need for the year. Um, and then there's a checklist, area needed in garden, number of fruit trees, nut trees, small fruit vines, sorghum, meat animals, hens, baby chicks, area and corn, wheat, cows, for milk supply and other items. Um, so that's a lot of planning you'd have to do to, to get all your family's needs met for food. Um, and, and I'll mention too, a lot of this education was tied to um, kind of bigger social, cultural um, context, obviously, in the sort of World War I era and then the Depression and World War II, there are different economic needs and <clears throat> um, rationing on foods um, and pressure for um, farm families to provide their own food and, and grow their own food um, to preserve other food rations to go to um, the troops or during the depression to be able to provide your own family's food when you don't have the income to um, purchase food, things like that. So uh, food was really powerful and it was really connected to sort of civic duty and patriotism and a lot of the materials that you see here um, for shifting kind of needs in their local communities and their state and their country. All kinds of stuff, really fascinating. So more things sort of communicating to the local demonstration agents, the leader's report, they'd have to put together a report um, awards they could give out, so an award of merit here um, that the, date, the agent could, so this is Ruth Current, I think I've seen, um, she's mentioned in some of our collections, um, to certify that this person of this club in their county, um, the county here, has satisfactorily completed the required work in this topic, so they could get these awards to give out for nutrition. Um, and sign, and this would be an award that presumably a woman would be um, proud to show. Um, you know, not everyone was really excited about extension. Some families or communities might have resisted the idea that, you know, people from uh, an outside place were coming to tell them how to do things, but um, there's more evidence that 
this being kind of a norm normative um, kind of am ambitious aspirational kind of program that people wanted to be a part of so the awards probably were motivating um, here's the requirements for the award of merit for the award. All right, now we're getting close to my one of my favorite documents. Um, this is some breakdowns, kind of charts for food production, vegetable and fruit canning budget. Canning, super important in providing for the family year-round. Um, and then this is one of my favorite documents, the Essentials for Good Nutrition. Um, and this is going to harken back to one of the things that I agree um, moderator that the sunshine being on the list of health requirements is fascinating. So the essentials for good nutrition here from the 1930s. Um, right food alone does not ensure good health. To make the best use of a well-selected dietary, the body requires fresh air, sunshine, exercise, correct posture, happiness, and rest. That's pretty accurate. I think that's really it, I just find this really interesting and refreshing to see that these are all considered really important. Um, and I need these reminders sometimes too, fresh air, essential. Um, but the reasoning here is just really interesting. It's essential for the burning of foodstuffs in the body to make new tissue and to aid in the elimination of waste products. You suffer less fatigue, think more clearly, and can work more rapidly when the air is fresh. So yeah, get outside, we, we like that. Sunshine, essential for normal growth and development, particularly in the bony structure of the body. Vitamin D, yeah, that makes sense. Daily exposure to direct rays protect the individual from disease, overcome fatigue and invigorate the body. Um, the short rays of the sun, the ultraviolet rays upon the body have the power of developing within the body, vitamin D, essential to normal growth. And again, I don't know how, um, this might have been a pretty novel concept. Um, I don't know when the understanding of UV rays um, developing vitamin D emerged, but I don't imagine it was much earlier than the early 20th century. So in the 1930s, um, this was probably somewhat new concept. I could be totally wrong about that, but the idea of vitamins and nutrients and things like that was generally, I think, came a lot out of the World War I era. Um, so this might have been 20 years or so old. Um, vitamin D is also available in cod liver oil, and for that reason, cod liver oil is often called bottled sunshine. Oh, wow. Cod liver oil, I've heard about it. I have not tried it, but I've never heard it called bottled sunshine. That's really interesting. Um, I wonder if anyone who's tried it would agree, but that's really cool. <laughs> um, good posture. I think I should observe a better posture right now. Not only has health value, but social, mental, and even a spiritual value. That's pretty significant. I didn't ever think of it that way, but um, makes a good impression. Standing straight, you have a clearer mind, feel more assurance, think more logically, and willing to take the initiative. Wow. Um, posture is pretty powerful. Standing or sitting tall, pulling and stretching upward until you actually feel tall. What if you're not tall, I guess? By standing tall, a person assumes good posture. The chest is high, the abdomen in, the back straight, and internal organs are in normal position. Free to do the work nature intended. Um, helpful reminder <laughs> about posture. I guess they, they, you know, posture is important, but it was particularly emphasized, I guess, more than, more than things that, more than it is today, perhaps. But it's good to have good posture. Um, happiness is an aid to health. I really love this because thinking about mental health, um, I don't imagine there was a great, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it, but I, I, I wouldn't, we don't understand, we didn't understand mental health in the same way in the 1930s than we do today. Um, but to understand the value of happiness to health, um, that's pretty essential. Let's see how they talk about this. Pleasant thoughts and emotions aid the flow of the secretions of the body. That's a statement that we could unpack. <laughs> um, whereas anger, fear, and anxiety hinder their flow, the mental attitude of an individual has a definite effect on health. 
And then, you know, we've seen the evidence of stress um, impacting physical outcomes and, you know, health outcomes. Um, so it would be interesting to see where these ideas came from and how the anecdotal or scientific uh, kind of research led to this point here. Um, I would love to know more about that because, you know, I think it's great that happiness is seen as a value to health. Um, but what would they do about someone who was not happy? Um, how would you approach that? And understanding of depression. I think in that period, uh, depression and anxiety were thought of as nerves and um, gendered ideas of hysteria and, and who was who had the privilege of being treated for, um, you know, any kind of mental health issues like that, maybe by going to a sanatorium, sanitarium, um, versus being institutionalized, things like that. A whole other history, but really cool to think about happiness being a value for health. I love that. And then rest is an essential part of health. It's as essential as food. I like that. To really rest, the individual must be able to put aside, for the time being, all anxiety or responsibility relax and give oneself up entirely to sleep or recreation. The tired feeling is caused by an accumulation of waste products from broken down tissues. During work, they accumulate faster than the lungs, kidneys, and skin can throw them off. While during the period of rest or sleep, the waste products at night, wait, the waste products are thrown off and the tissues renewed. A healthy person is tired at night, but fully rested in the morning after a full night's sleep. Most adults need eight to nine hours sleep at night, and housewives who have a long working day need a rest period during the day. That's pretty awesome. I think that's really cool that they're acknowledging that. Children need more sleep than adults because of the extra demands made upon them by growth and constant activity. Um, yeah, and that's, we live in a, <laughs> A society that doesn't always appreciate or offer rest as an important part of the day um, to stay healthy you know sleep we all hear sleep is important but to give the housewife permission to have a rest period during the day I am impressed by that I think that's pretty progressive and cool and then last on the list is food. Because it is part of health, they, they're acknowledging that's, that happens to be something that impacts health. Food, there are certain needs of the body which must be met with the correct choice of food. No one food will serve the purpose. There are carbohydrates, fats, proteins, minerals, vitamins, bulk, and water to be included in the daily meals. And this is what food does. Supplies heat and energy, builds new tissue and repairs old tissue, regulates the various processes of the body, promotes health and growth. So um, this is a teeny tiny little part of their their overall picture of, of health in this list. Um, but then it goes into more of the breakdown. This is where I love getting nutrition students and faculty to look at these things to see how they are describing um, the different needs of the body. Um, iron for blood building. Um, calcium for soft tissues, um, all kinds of stuff that, you know, this was new science at the time that was um, pretty cutting edge that they were teaching housewives and, and rural families about. Um, and then we see vitamin G preventing pellagra, vitamin D preventing rickets, vitamin C preventing scurvy. Um, all of these very real concerns for rural communities. So um, I'm going to kind of flip through the rest of this folder before we wrap up for today um, and just uh, give a little preview. Let's see. Um, they had different kind of pages that were tabs, I guess, for this binder. Um, so the next tab, meals for the family. It's back up here. What is this? Vegetables page about vegetables that has, we'll see a lot of recipes throughout the binder here. Um, 
and I have dreams of one day having some kind of meals where people can cook the recipes that we find in these um, booklets. I would definitely be down to make this chocolate bread pudding. That looks delicious. Uh, but vegetables, let's see some of these recipes. Um, boiled greens, asparagus tips, corn on the cob, carrots, buttered beets. Mm. I've never tried beets with butter. I don't think that would not be a bad thing. Boiled okra. Yeah. So meal planning. Then we've got the next folder. These tabs here. Let's see. This is paper that is pretty acidic. The it's gotten kind of yellow here and, and brittle around the edges. Um, meal planning and food preparation for good nutrition. Prune souffle. Anyone want to try that one? Um, making common winter vegetables uncommon. Sauteed parsnip salsify. Baked stuffed onions. Just stuff I, I just really want to see what that would be like in in um in real life baked stuffed onions so they got six large onions some chopped ham bacon or nuts breadcrumbs milk butter salt pepper so they would cut the onion top drain remove the center so it'd be like a little onion cup and then chop the center of the onions combine it with the ham breadcrumbs and seasoning and then fill the onions with that stuffing Put it in a buttered baking dish, cover with some more breadcrumbs and milk, and bake until tender. A slice of cheese may be laid over each onion before baking. So it's six. I never noticed that one before. I would be very curious to try that. It's like a stuffed peppers, but with onions instead. Fascinating. Great. So more things about what nutritional work food is doing, energy giving, building foods, Muscle, bone, blood, energy giving, regulating foods, growth promoting, and protective foods. Um, all fascinating and great information. Getting the most for the food dollar. Oh boy, yep. Foamy omelet, mm. okay. And next section here, the farm food supply. Raising standards, addressing malnutrition, really big topic, um, really important for caring for their families and their children especially. Um, okay, here's the cake scorecard, scorecard for plain cake. Some options for club refreshments when your extension club or your 4-H club gets together. Things you can do and make for them. Oh, lovely. The child in the home. Food for the child. Let's see what else. Points to work for in children. Posture, of course. And this section is substitutes for sub suggested subjects for additional programs to need your project program or special meetings. Lots of recipes, ooh, Christmas dinner um, decorations. His mirth, not dishes, set the table off. Christmas candies, popcorn balls. I will definitely be interested in trying a lot of those things. Um, and then there's things like this invalid cookery, things to cook for people who are sick. Um, liquid diet, soft or light diet, convalescent diet. Picnic lunch all kinds of occasions. Mm. Use of cornmeal. You see a lot of stuff 
about cornmeal, especially enriched cornmeal um, that was uh, pushed for rural communities by the administration agents, um, enriched to uh, meet the needs of a lot of malnourished um, communities and preventing foie gras and things like that. So lots of recipes with cornmeal in them. And I think there's even a cool video on our digital collections page that came from African American Extension, one of the home demonstration agents in the 50s, um, teaching uh, about cooking with enriched cornmeal. It's pretty cool. If you go on the digital collections page and search for enriched cornmeal, I think it should come up there. Um, it's pretty, pretty wonderful. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up here with our scorecard for judging breads, cakes, and cookies. Um, appearance, flavor, crumb, lightness. I wonder how someone like the British baking um, competition would stand up to this. How they would, if they would agree or disagree with some of the recipes and rubric for judging these things. So thank you for hanging out with me and reading a lot of stuff about food and nutrition from the 1930s from our um, Cooperative Extension home demonstration records. Um, this is stuff I'm really excited about and I hope um, some of you out there might find this interesting. These are all things that are in our collections that are open to the public. Anyone can come and use them. You can go on our website and explore um, our collection guides, our digitized collections. Um, you can use the digital stuff from anywhere you might be in the world, um, any time and place you might be. Um, it's there for the world to use. Any of our physical collections, um, these are open for researchers um, by appointment only right now. So if you're in the Raleigh area, you can uh, contact us, let us know what you want to see, or ask us some questions to see if you have what you're interested in and we can work with you to, to you know, help you find what you need. Um, if you want to come in to look at any of our materials, you uh, let us know what you want to see, you schedule an appointment, come to the H Hill Library and um, our reading room is here and ready for you to spread out and look at a folder like this. You can spend as much time as you need. If you need to come for several days in a row, we can work with you to um, set up multiple appointments. Um, and this is just a little taste of some of what we have in our collections. We have so many other topics, um, fascinating, wide range of materials. So in the coming months, you'll be hearing from other folks in our department and um, students and faculty who work with these collections to show um, some of the neat stuff that's in here. I don't like to call it hidden because none of it's hidden. It's all here. It's all open in our collection guides, but it's not all obvious to the world. So um, we want to help highlight some of this cool stuff. If you have any questions, you can always contact us. We have a contact form on our website um, that we can link in the chat. Um, you can send us questions. You can request materials that way. Um, and if you have a question from our stream today you can contact us that way as well and, and let us know um, you know requesting a certain topic for a future um, uh, stream so um, thanks for joining me and this was fun um, I hope you all have a great long weekend